The topic of today's talk is evaluating back and neck pain in a cancer patient. My name is Dr. Andrew Fabiano. I'm a neurosurgeon at Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York. I have no disclosures. The learning objectives for today's talk are as follows. Number one, describe the clinical evaluation of neck and back pain in a cancer patient. Number two, discuss indications for imaging in a cancer patient with new neck or back pain. And number three, describe the importance of the sequence of treatment events in a patient with a history of cancer and neck or back pain. Spinal metastatic disease is the most common neoplasm of the spine. It occurs in up to 70% of patients with a primary cancer diagnosis. Uh, spinal metastatic disease can involve multiple levels in up to 40% of cases. And what you see here is a representative MRI. This is a sagittal MRI image. You can see the vertebral bodies, the spinal cord posterior to the vertebral bodies. And what you can see are multiple levels of vertebral bodies that enhance with contrast, indicating the presence of spinal metastatic disease. This is just a brief review of spinal anatomy. These are representative sagittal MRIs of the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, and the lumbar spine. And what you see in each case is anteriorly you have your vertebral bodies. Between the vertebral bodies are intervertebral discs. Just posterior to the intervertebral discs and vertebral body is the spinal canal. The spinal canal is the area that houses the spinal cord. And you can see here your cervical spinal cord, your thoracic spinal cord, and your lumbar spinal cord. Lumbar spinal cord typically terminates at the L1-2 intervertebral disc level. And you can see that here, and below that level you have your phylum terminale. Phylum terminale is made up of nerve roots that will go to supply uh, nervous innervation to lumbar and sacral uh, dermatomal areas. And what you can see when you look at the alignments of the spine is in both the cervical spine and in the lumbar spine, there's a natural lordosis or curvature to the spine. In the thoracic spine, there's a natural uh, kyphosis or curvature to the spine. And you can see uh, when you kind of look at all of these images in total, there's a pretty good uniform um, appearance in terms of the space between the vertebral bodies, the size of the vertebral bodies, and the size of the spinal canal. So certainly paramount to the evaluation of a patient uh, with any form of neck or back pain, uh, both with a, with a history of cancer or without, is a good history. Uh, and the history starts with the descriptive factors of that pain. Is it stabbing? Is it burning? Uh, does, is it throbbing? Does it radiate? Does it come and go? And also the location. Is that pain just in the neck, just in the back? Uh, does it radiate uh, down an arm or down a leg? or does it wrap around the rib cage is what can happen when a thoracic nerve root is irritated. Certainly you want to differentiate between axial loading type pain and radiculopathy. Axial loading pain is pain that occurs when a patient is upright. Typically the spine supports a person when they're standing upright. Uh, if the spine has lost some of its ability to support you, uh, when you stand up against the force of gravity, you'll uh, experience pain in that region. Uh, and so if you want to elicit uh, whether or not a patient has axial loading type pain, you ask questions whether they experience pain when they're upright, do they experience pain when they're walking around, and does that pain improve with recumbency. You want to ask if this is old or new pain. Uh, certainly if this is a pain that a person has had for 30 years, uh, it hasn't changed, uh, your index of suspicion uh, of spinal metastatic disease is much lower than in a person who has no history of back or neck pain and now experiences uh, worsening neck pain over the past two months. Um, is there any sign of neurolog neurologic dysfunction? Does the patient have new weakness or numbness? Uh, has the patient uh, started to use an assisted de device, a new cane or walker in order to get around? Certainly, uh, needing to use a cane is something that's not normal and that should immediately alert you that there could be an issue. Um, one uh, more subtle question uh, to ask about uh, proximal muscle weakness is, does this patient, ask the patient, do they have difficulty getting up, up from a chair, difficulty going upstairs? And that may alert you to proximal muscle weakness that isn't noted uh, in other events, such as typical walking. Uh, and you also want to ask about bowel and bladder incontinence. Um, that typically occurs uh, once a patient's um, Spinal compression is more advanced, however, 
Um, isolated bladder incontinence in particular can sometimes be the, one of the first signs of spinal cord irritation. The next step after a detailed history is a physical exam uh, for your patient. Uh, you certainly want to test for patient strength. This includes individual muscle testing. Uh, you also want to test the patient's gait. In some cases of spinal cord compression and proximal muscle weakness, patient may have uh, full strength or near full strength individual muscle testing, uh, but on gross testing such as gait or tandem gait, they have difficulty. Uh, you want to test the patient's sensation. Certainly test uh, for any signs of uh, upper motor neuron dysfunction or long track signs like hyperreflexia or clonus. When you look at all of these together, again, if this is a patient you've been following for a long period of time, even a subtle change uh, in their neurologic function should prompt you uh, to look more closely into whether this patient has spinal metastatic disease. So uh, when you're evaluating these patients in your office, certainly any patient with a known history of cancer and a new back or neck pain, new neurologic dysfunction, you should have a high uh, index of suspicion for spinal metastatic disease. You should always consider spinal metastatic disease in your differential diagnosis in a patient who has a history of cancer and has new neck, back, or low back pain. And while it, with patient, in patients who have degenerative disease and uh, report a new back pain, you may initially have them go through a round of physical therapy or observe them with non-steroidal medications. If patients have a history of cancer, the uh, treatment algorithm is different. And these patients, once they present with this new neck or back pain, new neurologic sign, you should progress directly to imaging to evaluate the affected area. In patients with new weakness, again, you should have a high index of suspicion for spinal metastatic disease uh, if those patients have a history of cancer. Um, any sign of imbalance or any new uh, need for an assistive device like a cane or a walker should prompt you to have that patient undergo uh, um, imaging of their affected area of the spine. The typical progression, if untreated in patients with spinal metastatic disease, is first they have some imbalance, then they use a cane, then they use a walker, and then they're in a wheelchair. And certainly we want to identify these patients as soon uh, in that course of progression as possible so that we can prevent them from further neurologic deterioration and also preserve their current level of neurologic function. So just a brief recap, patients with a history of cancer and a new pain in their neck or back, patients with a history of cancer and a new neurologic deficit or sign or symptom, those patients should undergo uh, MRI imaging of the affected area. Also included in this slide are those patients who undergo screening scans. So in some instances, patients will undergo periodic CAT scan screens uh, in order to evaluate for their primary disease. If in those screening images, lesions are seen anywhere along the spinal column, they should then be further uh, identified, clarified with an MRI image. Certainly MRI imaging is the standard uh, imaging that's used to evaluate spinal metastatic disease. Lesions typically will begin in the vertebral body and they have a propensity to extend through the pedicle and destroy the pedicle at the affected level. And what you see here is just re again represented M representative MRI imaging. You can see this sagittal MRI of the thoracic spine. You have your vertebral bodies that are nicely uh, uniform in terms of their size and shape. And then at the affected level, this lesion enhances with contrast. It's gone from a nice square to pancaking down to a, a longer, thin uh, vertebral body due to a pathologic fracture secondary to the metastatic disease. And that portion of the vertebral body that has been herniated posteriorly is now compressing the spinal cord. And you can see the spinal cord is pinched off at that level. There's T2 signal change or a sign that the spinal cord is affected both above and below that level. If you look at the axial imaging, this dark circle here is actually the area of the spinal cord. The, the white mass around it is contrast enhanced tumor that has now encased the spinal cord. Uh, it is affecting the spinal cord and in that patient, uh, the patient developed myelopathy and also weakness in the lower extremities. So uh, in patients with a newly identified spinal metastatic disease, they should be evaluated by a spinal surgeon and also their medical oncologist. Um, the workup at that point is uh, really twofold. One, you need a spinal surgeon to evaluate that patient, determine if they're a candidate for surgery, 
determine the extent uh, of neurologic dysfunction. You also need to have an overall evaluation of the patient's cancer status, and that's where the medical oncologist is involved to get updated staging scans and evaluate uh, the patient's overall status. If the patient has weakness or myelopathy, corticosteroids may be initiated. Uh, certainly if you're going to initiate corticosteroids, the patient should also be on GI prophylaxis. In some patients who don't have significant weakness, uh, corticosteroids won't be initiated to avoid the toxicities associated with those medications. So there are several treatment options available for spinal metastatic disease. Those include observation, uh, medical management, in some instances a patient will uh, be kept on their current chemotherapy regimen with just closer surveillance of their spinal lesions, uh, radiotherapy, surgery, a combination of those uh, different treatments, and also, also kyphoplasty, which is a minimally invasive surgical uh, procedure that's used to treat the pain associated with a vertebral body lesion. So the treatment goals in a patient with spinal metastatic disease include preservation of neurologic function, tumor control, overall patient survival, and decreased pain. Categories of patients uh, with spinal metastatic disease are really grouped uh, into uh, a few different categories. One is those patients with myelopathy as compared to those without myelopathy, those patients with spinal st instability as opposed to those without spinal instability, and those patients who are neurologically intact without spinal instability. And really a landmark uh, study came out by Roy Patchell uh, that was published in Lancet in 2005. And this was a study that compared patients with spinal metastatic, that looked at patients with spinal metastatic disease and myelopathy. So the patients had metastatic disease, they had some level of spinal cord compression uh, that was identified by either signs of uh, long tract neurologic dysfunction such as hyperreflexia or clonus or lower extremity weakness. And this study grouped patients into two categories. Patients treated with surgery followed by radiation therapy and those patients treated by radiation therapy alone. And the primary endpoint of the study was a patient's ability to ambulate. And what the study found is those patients in the surgical group, so patients with myelopathy who underwent surgery followed by radiation therapy, they had improved ambulation, they ambulated over a longer period of time, they had improved uh, survival and functional status, and a decreased need for steroids and opioids. And I think what this uh, study demonstrates, in addition to the value of surgery followed by radiation in this population, is the um, effect that a patient's ability to ambulate has on their overall status. Uh, if a patient isn't able to ambulate and is bedridden, they may not be eligible for certain uh, chemotherapy, and they often choose to uh, undergo a more palliative treatment course. Uh, certainly uh, not being able to ambulate greatly affects a person's quality of life, uh, and so by preserving a, a person's ability to walk, you also preserve their ability to get future treatments uh, for their primary disease. Uh, another point that was highlighted uh, by this study and, and several subsequent studies is the effect of overall prognosis on the benefit of surgical intervention. And really, certainly what I use in my practice and what is, is fairly standard is that you want to only operate on those patients who have a greater than six month prognosis. Uh, and so that just again highlights the uh, importance of a multidisciplinary approach to these patients. Uh, medical oncology, uh, a medical oncologist's input uh, in describing the, the overall patient prognosis is very important consideration pri prior to electing to, for a patient to undergo surgical intervention. And this is just again a representative CT scan of a patient who underwent uh, surgical intervention. Uh, this is the patient who we saw uh, her MRI before. She underwent a corpectomy at that level with an expandable cage placement. You can see there's no longer any material that's herniated posteriorly towards the spinal cord. There's also a lateral plate that's put into place and you can see she has good spinal alignment. One addition, additional point that's uh, very important to note uh, it relates to the timing of surgery and radiotherapy. Surgery should be performed prior to any radiation therapy for spinal metastatic disease. Uh, 
those patients undergoing radiotherapy followed by surgery actually did much worse than any of the either two groups. What happens is once a patient's undergone radiotherapy to a spinal level, that level is hypersensitive to pain in the future. So if a patient undergoes surgery after their radiation treatment, they're much more likely to have a protracted hospital course and ultimately much more likely to enter hospice care. So uh, in almost every case, we try to avoid operating on patients once they've undergone radiation therapy. And so what that, uh, again, highlights is the importance of uh, surgical evaluation prior to any radiation treatment. And in those patients who have spinal instability, meaning they have axial loading type back or neck pain, uh, their spine is unstable, we recommend stabilizing that spine prior to radiation therapy. And this is just a, it's a very busy slide, uh, but it's a representative algorithm uh, from the NCCN National Guidelines on the Treatment of Spinal Metastatic Disease. And it basically sums up what we've been talking about. Uh, and just to, to you know, highlight those areas again, uh, in patients with greater than six months prognosis, if they're myelopathic, meaning they have either hyperreflexia or clonus, lower extremity weakness, uh, surgery followed by radiation therapy is recommended treatment. Patients with spinal instability, those patients should undergo surgery followed by radiotherapy. And if a patient's neurologically intact and has no evidence of spinal instability, they should undergo radiotherapy alone. And uh, in any case, if you can avoid uh, patients undergoing surgery after radiation therapy, uh, that certainly is the optimal treatment plan. Uh, and, and thus, the, the sequence of events is just as important, just as important as the treatment being delivered uh, in spinal metastatic disease. So this is just a case representation of a patient with spinal metastatic disease. This is a 63-year-old man who presented to his PMD with mid-back pain. Uh, this was new pain for him. He reported that he would occasionally have pain in his low back off and on, but this mid-back pain was something new. Uh, he did have a history of prostate cancer, and his PMD noted that his patellar reflexes uh, were uh, hyperreflexic bilaterally, and this was a new finding. Uh, so he had the patient undergo an MRI of his thoracic spine. And what you can see here is multi-level vertebral body disease. There are multiple areas where spinal metastatic disease is entered into the vertebral body. You can see at the T7 level, there's a pathologic compression fracture. Again, you have your nice block vertebral body, pancake down, the posterior portion pressing against the spinal cord at this level. Uh, you can see there's also epidural disease posteriorly, which is further compressing the spinal cord. If we look at the axial um, MRI uh, sequence, here's the vertebral body. There's the ribs coming off. This is the spinal cord right here. You can see that there's a great deal of epidural uh, tumor that's within the spinal, compare, spinal canal compressing the spinal cord. So the patient was referred to a neurosurgeon. Uh, he underwent uh, full screening images, screening images and evaluation by his medical oncologist. He was determined to have a prognosis greater than one year. So this patient underwent a, a thoracic laminectomy, epidural tumor removal, spinal stabilization procedure. And you can see uh, on just these plain x-rays, uh, this is the lateral, lateral, this is coronal view, uh, the screws and rods that were inserted for spinal stabilization. Uh, the patient did well postoperatively and subsequently uh, underwent postoperative radiotherapy. And the patient maintained his ability to ambulate and he had a significant decrease of, in his pain following the procedure. Two years postoperatively, the patient is pain-free he is uh, able to ambulate without assistance. His primary disease remains under control, and he's had no recurrence of disease at the affected levels. So just in summary, spinal metastatic disease is a very common problem. In patients with a history of cancer and new neck or back pain, a physician should have a very low threshold for imaging and if spinal surgery is to be performed for spinal metastatic disease, it should be performed prior to radiation therapy. So thank you very much. I appreciate you spending the time to view this uh, talk, um, and it's been my pleasure to be able to present it to you.